Well, if you have your Bibles, let's jump into the Word this morning in uh, Joshua chapter 7. We're going to be looking at a story um, of a battle that did not quite go well, but it turned out to go a lot better after we got some things in alignment. And this morning, I just want to talk to you simply about revival, the church, <clears throat> and the comeback. The culture that we're living in right now uh, is somewhat challenging, and it's a difficult season, and we think maybe there's not much hope, or it seems like the bright uh, light that used to glimmer within the world of the church and the community has been diminished some. But I want to challenge not just Forest Hill Church, but the Big C Church, the church of the living God, the kingdom church that we all are striving for, to see life change and transformation happen so that souls can be one to the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but I believe Jesus Christ is coming back. I believe that he is soon to be returning, and I believe that he is going to call us all home and to be with him, but I believe he also means that he's going to call all home. I, I, I think he wants to take more than just me and you here today. I think he wants to take a whole lot more with him. And, and I believe in order for that to happen, there's some victories that need to take place within our lives and within our spirit and within the church so that we can see the comeback that God wants to have. Amen? Amen. In this story this morning, I'm not going to read all of this scripture and work through all that's here in this story. We're going to kind of glean through it as we work through this today, but I believe that there's sometimes in the church world some setbacks that take place. I believe there's some hindrances and some holdups that keep us from experiencing or, or having the things that the Lord intends for us to have, and, and I think there's some things that we can do to transition that within our life so that we can see the comeback be greater than what we have been in the setback. You see, in this story in Joshua chapter 7, the children of Israel had committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. They had gone into battle against Ai, and they didn't prepare themselves for the battle properly. Now, if you are a Bible-holding person, whether it's one that is of paper or one that glows, if you jump back to Joshua chapter 1 and look in those scripture there, verse 3, Jesus was telling Joshua after he, Moses had died, he said, listen, every place that your soul or your foot will tread upon, I will give you as I said to Moses. So here Joshua is getting encouragement that, hey, every place that you go, I'm going to give you. This is a word for the church today. God is telling us that we as the church, every place we go, he's going to give us. And he's reminding Joshua, hey, just like I've told Moses. And then in verse 5 it says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And I will not leave you nor forsake you. It's a good promise for us today, isn't it, church? That God will never leave us nor forsake us. He even reminds us of that in the New Testament, that he's always going to be with us. But he says this, the book of the law, in verse 8, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, and that you may observe to do according to all that is written, and for then you will make your way prosperous, and you then will have good success. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So you see here, Jesus is, our God is telling Joshua, hey, just as I have told Moses, I'm telling you, everything's going to work out to your, to your good and for your benefit. But you have to keep my commands. You have to keep my word in your heart. You have to meditate it on it day and night. And so Joshua pulls the children of Israel together and they spy out the land and they get ready to cross over the river Jordan and they see all of the inhabitants and they see the things that are there just as they had seen years prior before this moment. But this time there's something different. This time there's a spirit that has risen up within them that says we are going to go and take the land that has been promised to us. We're not going to sit here on this side of the river any longer. We're going to go ahead and press forward. And so through the help of what the Lord does through the spies when they come back, the spies said to Joshua, the Lord is with us and he will surely give us the victory. You hear me today, church? 
The Lord is with us and he will surely give us the victory. I don't know about you here at Forest Hill, but I know for us as the church, as the big C, we seem like there's not going to be a victory. We seem like maybe the church is imploding or being destroyed by what is happening in the culture. Maybe because of the political arraignment that's going on or maybe it's because of all the hatred and, and the division that's happening within our, our country or maybe it's because now the month of June is considered a pride month and they celebrate things that are not necessary kosher and in line with what the Word of God says. But I'm here to encourage you and challenge you and remind us all that God is still the same God today as He was yesterday and He will be forever. It doesn't matter what the world may try to say. It doesn't matter maybe what they'll do. It doesn't matter how they may try to come against us. It, all that matters is that Jesus Christ is still in heaven and He still saves he still delivers and he will still give us victory. Amen, church. God is ready to do something phenomenal in the church and he wants to use us as the comeback. We, though, have to position ourselves and get ready for what God wants to do. And so we see here in this story, in verse 27 of chapter 6, it says, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all of the country. Why did his fame spread? Because he defeated Jericho. One of the greatest battles that they could go against, he goes up against them and wins through the power of God. But the Bible says that his fame, Joshua's fame, was all over the land. I believe what happens to us as a church is whenever our fame, the name of who we are, is greater than the name of who he is, we then seem to kind of get full of what we can do because we think we did it. But the reality is we cannot do anything but through Christ Jesus. And so Joshua here gets a little full of himself, his soldiers, his army, the men, the women, the, the, the community, the tribes, they all are a little bit more full of themselves, and we find them coming to chapter 7. I know you're all looking at me and thinking, boy, he's just now getting started. It's going to go quick. Put on your seatbelt. There's this transitional word in chapter 7, verse 1. It says, but. But. The children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accused. But, church, I don't know about you, but whenever there seems to be a but in the, in the sentence, or sometimes whenever our buts get in the way, I meant that literally. <laughs> Stay with me. I, hey, I'm still the same. I ain't changed much. Pastor Quinley, I'm sorry if I do anything wrong today. You could just correct me afterwards. You're, you're taking good notes. You, you'll help, you always help me out. I so much appreciate you. It's so good to see you today, you and Sister Quinley. It was good to see you yesterday as well. It's also good to have Mary's mom and dad here with us as they just stepped in to be in church with us today. But there's always a challenge whenever that word but comes in. So the Lord was with Joshua and there was fame. But the people broke faith. Israel had broken faith in regards to the devoted things. You see, God had commanded Joshua and the people to destroy everything of Jericho, but they didn't. And what's wrong sometimes with us in the churches is we try to hold on to some of the things that what we thought was great or spectacular because it was a wonderful move or a wonderful opportunity. We try to hold on to things whenever God says, I never intended for that to be your sustaining life source. See, even whenever the children of Israel were in the wilderness, he provided new food daily. They had to eat what was given, and the rest of it would just go away. Why? Because he gave them fresh manna every single day. God doesn't want us as the church to live off an old revival or an old experience. He wants us to remember and recant and recall because there's things that we had to do to get through that revival or to get to that point in time, but he also wants for us to move forward to what he wants to do today because God wants to do a new thing in the earth as the scripture says. He wants to raise up a new, new foundation for a generation of followers to see him in truth and in power and in love. And so we see here that Achan disobeyed and he did something that was against what was told. 
And as we go through chapter 7, the spies go into Ai. Joshua didn't break his tradition. He did what, he, what Moses did. He did what he did whenever he sent his people into, uh, over the Jordan to Jericho. And then he's doing it again here. He sends some spies in. See, there's some things that we know to do is right, right? We know some actions and some things that we do is okay to do. In Joshua, it was all right to send in spies because it's good to know what you're about to walk into, isn't it, church? It's good to know what you're about to face and what you're about to come up against. And so he does that. But what happens here is, is his people are a little full of themselves. His people have gotten a little bold in the fact that they just defeated Jericho. And they come back to Joshua and they say, hey, Joshua, you know what? There's probably 12,000 people here, which means there's probably maybe 2,000 fighting men. So let's just send 3,000 over and we'll win this battle. This will be easy. There's no sense in preparing everyone. There's no sense in doing all the hard work. There's no need to put everybody out for this battle because they're just not as great as what they seem to be on the outside. So Joshua listens to the spies and he neglected a few things that he knew that he needed to do to prepare for this battle. And he sent the guys in. And as the story continues to go, the, 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 the 3,000 men go over and Ai rises up against them and attacks them and 36 men die and they flee for their lives and they run back and they, they get back to, to Joshua and Joshua sees, gets here in verse 6. It says, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. And he had the elders of Israel and they put dust on their heads. Why did he do that? Because the people came back to him, the, the 3,000, and said, 36 of our men just died. They're coming after us. They're not what we thought they were. You see, church, in order for us to see revival take place for a generation, we can't just talk about what used to be. We can't fight the demons and the devils that are fighting a generation today like what we did when we fought the ones that we faced back then because they're different today. They dress up quite well today. They look quite like all of us today. Everything seems to be so convoluted today that it's hard to discern which one's which or not the other. So the sheep and the wolves are, are kind of intermingling and we, they, 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 we all kind of look somewhat similar and so we don't know how to fight or how to go against or how to say. And So then we find ourselves on a social media platform debating and, and arguing and, and trying to ridicule or, or stand for God and the scriptures and, and tear someone down on a social media platform where there is no emotion, there is no tone or inflection of love. It's just words on a page and that does not communicate well. That is not how God intended for us to love our neighbor and speak truth in love because they can't hear the heartfelt concern that we have for the people. All they see are words on a screen. And we're fighting against an enemy that's coming against the church and we feel like the church is no longer able to be victorious. But let me remind you of something that God told Joshua in the first part of this story in verse 1. I'm going to be with you and I'm going to give you every piece of land where your foot steps. What do we need to be reminded of, church? What God said here, he's saying to us today. If we want to see revival break out in our church, then we need to stand on the promises of what God's Word says. We need to step out in faith and believe and, have, and speak things that are not as if they were. We need to have grace in our language when we talk to others. We need to have love in our heart, not bitterness. We need to go after these individuals who need a touch of God. But maybe it's because we ourselves have been drained. And we're weakened because we haven't prepared ourselves well. Maybe we just feel like there is no hope. Maybe we feel like because of the current climate, it is what it is. So we hold to the hope of Jesus Christ returning. But I don't believe God just intends for us to hold to a hope today, church. I believe he wants us to take the hope of the fact that he is returning and bring joy and love and peace and grace and mercy to a generation or to a community that needs the love of Christ greater than what we could ever think or imagine. 
Because these enemies that we're facing today are not quite the same and, and, and set up the same way as they were a little while back. So Joshua's upset. He's saddened. He's depressed. He's woe is me. He puts dust on his head. Kind of sound like how we are in the church right now, isn't it? We're like, oh, well, woe is me, Lord. Where are you? Why isn't revival? Why aren't people coming to church anymore? Why aren't the doors just, why, why aren't this, and why is it that, and why did they leave, and why did they do this, and why are this that happened, and why is this happening, why is this going this way? And I believe God wants to remind us as the church, number one, we are victorious. So let's get out of the mully grubs of where we are or where we think we are and start asking God, God, what is it that you want to do? What is the new thing that you want to do? Lord, I know I'm in age, but God, let me do a new thing. I love it in the New Testament whenever Jesus did a miracle and, and the people looked at him and, and they said, well, we've never seen it done like this before. It's because God wants to do a new thing in the church. But there's some things that we have to understand. God has delivered Joshua all the way up to this point. But he neglected prayer, consecration. You see, before he went into the battle of Jericho, he went for three days and prayed and fasted and sought the face of God for a victory because he knew that without God, that he would not be victorious. So what did he do? He knew only the right thing to do and to go and be in the presence of God. Matter of fact, if you go back in chapter 5, it says that he was in the presence of God and the holiness of God in that moment, actually just like Moses was, kind of taking off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. He had one of those moments with the Lord before he went into the battle of Jericho. What am I saying to us today, church? We sometimes think that God wants to do something through us and with us, and he does but we think that he's just going to do it without anything on our part we think because we've done all of this back here that he's going to do something new right here but in order for God to do something new right here we've got to take what we did back here and start doing it right here again so we need to pray and consecrate ourselves before God as a holy church and believe without doubt in our heart that God is wanting to do something great and stand fast on the word of God and not berate people by what we think is in here but love people because of what is in here it said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life it didn't say that it was just a select few it didn't say that it was just a certain church name he said so that everyone in this earth could experience the love of Jesus Christ I don't know about you Forest Hill but I'm ready to experience the love of God like I have never experienced him before I'm ready to see a move of God in the church of God like I have never seen before and the only way that that is going to come is if we pray and consecrate ourselves before a holy God he neglected the things that he knew to do that were right and because of that God allowed bad things to happen to them and see church I believe God has allowed us as the church to have struggle not because the church is defeated. We know the Bible says the church is going to be victorious. We know what the word says, but we are living a defeated moment right now. We're kind of scathed and we're kind of disheartened and we're throwing dust on our heads and we're, we're walking around with the mully grubs when this is the season and this is the time that we stand fast, put our shoulders up and say, I don't care what pandemic the world may come. I don't care what lesbian or, or gay or, or rich, rights or, or diversity or hatred or whatever might come against me as a church or a believing person in the church of God. I'm going to stand firm for what the word of God says. I'm not going to hate you because of the way that you think but I am going to love you to help you understand the way God thinks I'm going to walk it out with you and through this story and I'm not just talking about those situations it's other things that's in our lives and in the church that's, that's hurting us and destroying us from the inside 
gossip and backbiting and hatred and, and malice and jealousy and envy. The reason that Achan took the things he was not supposed to take was because he was uh, covet, coveting the things that Jericho had. That's why he took it. He broke the tenth commandment. In chapter 1, he said, keep my commands and meditate, them on, meditate on them day and night. But Achan broke the commandment. He neglected what he was supposed to do. He neglected what he knew that he was supposed to do. And I believe that the church is time for us to stop neglecting the things that we know that we're supposed to do. Let's do those things well. And I guarantee you God will do his part even better if we do those things well. Pray, fast, believe, not negate. You see, we see in the language here, even in Exodus 14, it said it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than it would be for us to die in the wilderness. Oh, that we had died into the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. They, they, Joshua started reflecting back to all of the negative things because of this defeat that was in his life. And God just simply responds very poignantly in chapter 7, verse 10. He says, so the Lord said to Joshua, Get up! Get up! Why do you sit or lie here thus on your face? Get up! Church, if we can hear the word right now of anything that we need to do, we just need to get up. Just get up. I believe if we do the things of praying and fasting and consecrating ourselves before God, I believe that revival comes for the church when we activate and get up. Not when we sit back. God doesn't want to come and pour out his, his spirit or his blessing on just a vessel that's like this that's not ready to receive. He wants to pour out his blessing to a vessel that has hands lifted and, and, and hearts turned toward him so that whenever it's poured in them, it then can be flowed through them. We miss it sometimes when we think about revival in the church. Revival is only to spark something in us so that we can continue or hold fast to move forward. Not so that we can just say, man, that was a good word or that was a good service or the Holy Ghost really did move today. I believe God is ready for us in positioning us to get up as a church, the big C church. Not so that we can seem victorious or put a pin on our shirt or our blazer of what we are doing but so that the glory could go all to God Almighty and people can see Him for who He is. It's coming a time, church. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that moment with God. I don't want to be separated from it. <clears throat> the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things, and they had stolen, and they lied. They put them among the belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. And I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. I believe God wants us to pay attention in some areas of our life where we neglect today, church. I believe that God is setting a standard for us even today from this Old Testament story that we can still do what we know is right if we cannot continue to neglect a few things that we know we're supposed to be doing. If you haven't read your Bible in a long time, maybe you don't even know where it is. It means that you have some neglect there in your life. Maybe if worship music has become sound, a, a sound that just seems unappealing to you, then it means that there's a desire or a lacking there and a neglect that we need to rekindle today. Maybe you haven't had a conversation in ages about what God is saying to you or teaching you. Then there's some neglect that's there. And on our part of fellowship, God wants us to commune with one another. And, and I know that we have been isolated for months and separated. But the testament of who God is and the faithfulness of what he's done can still be shared and can still be communicated and still spoken. 
Maybe you're struggling with believing that God hears and answers prayers. Listen, God is still a miracle working God. He is still one who can heal, save, and deliver. He has not changed from that. Maybe we don't see it like we used to. The signs and wonders aren't following after us like we are uh, prone to, but God is still on this throne. He still wants to do mighty and powerful things, but we maybe aren't seeing it, and so we think maybe, maybe we're just not like we should be or maybe God's just not going to do like he used to or maybe it's not true what the Bible is saying maybe the church isn't victorious let me squash all of that today because he is better than what we let on in our life most of your Christian friends are irritated or annoyed by you or you irritate or annoy them it's because you've lost the grace factor listen there's some people that you love and there's some people that you just have to endure amen and if it's the person sitting next to you, just nod. I mean, and don't, don't bump them. Don't look at them. Don't say anything. Sometimes it's just the way it is in life, but God gives us a grace factor that helps us deal with the ones that we don't quite like. Just like he gives us the love to love the ones that we do, but he wants us to have the love for all, right? So he gives us a measure of grace to sustain us through those maybe. Maybe you feel like going to church is somewhat of a chore today. There's some things that we need to collect. But listen, as we get ready to kind of transition this, don't settle for superficial change. Don't settle for superficial change. Go to the root of the problem, whatever the root of the issue is. If you want to see a powerful move of God, go to the root of the problem to be able to address and to pluck out and to pull out. Listen, I'm not much of a flower person or a garden person. I don't do that well, never have, probably never will, I don't guess. But <clears throat> I do know this much about weeds. If I want to kill them, I can cut them off with a weed eater and they'll come back. I can spray them with what they call Roundup and they'll still come back. <laughs> I can do all of the things that they can suggest for me to do and I can't can, can, can kill that weed. But the only way I know I can get rid of that weed is how? Pull the root up out of the ground and that baby ain't going to come back no more, is it? It's going to be gone. It's going to be dealt with, so to speak. If I want to see something transpire in my life, if I want to see God set revival in this place or in the church, the big C, then I need to go to the root of my problem. God, what have I been neglecting? What have I not been doing that I know that I'm supposed to be doing? Because listen, when Joshua did what he was supposed to, he beat Jericho. When he didn't do what he was supposed to, he got his butt beat. And right now, we as a church may feel like we're getting our tails beat. But hey, y'all are all Alabama fans. Y'all don't ever lose. Come on. I mean, let's get real here in the house today. Hey, can I get a roll tide somewhere? I mean, anybody. I mean, I, usually during a prayer time, whenever we were here, there would be at least one roll tide. And listen, I know the hell state to the baseball. Amen, Jesus' name. Amen, hallelujah. But hey, when you are so used to winning all the time, you'd think that you don't ever could lose. Sometimes we feel that way because, see, back here in the church days, when I go back to the old days, so to speak, and you know, I know you're looking at me and thinking, son, you ain't very old. You're right. I do have a little gray hair. But when I go back to hearing the stories that you've told me whenever we served here, I remember and recall and recant what God and how God moved and what he did and the revival and the anointing and the, and, and, and the Holy Ghost services of, of students and children and adults and people alike laying out in the Spirit. Why? Because we were seeking after God. We need to go to the root. Listen, I don't want to be Achan. And I'm so grateful for the grace of God that God doesn't deal with us like he told Joshua to deal with the tribe and the family of Achan. Because the story goes on that God spoke to Joshua when God, Joshua finally did get up and he went into prayer and he sought the face of God. God said, okay, we're going to deal with the root issue before we go back into battle. We're going to get this squared away so that you can understand that my way is the highway, so to speak. My way is the right way. And so he goes before the Lord and the Lord spoke to him and said, bring all of the tribes together. I'll call them out all the way down till we get to the, the, the root issue. Now listen, Achan knew what was about to happen. He knew that, that God was, had spoken to Joshua and Joshua was supposed to call out the crowd and come down to him. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I'd have had enough horse sense to go to him in his private tent and said, hey, listen, Joshua, it was me. I'm the one that stole this. You know, I, I would be uh, afraid to just hold out until I got to the moment. I don't know what I would have, would have, I guess I still would have died, but I would have at least gone to him in private instead of having to wait to be called out in public. If you go on and read the story, he goes on until every tribe all the way down to Achan's tribe and his family was standing before him. And Achan said, Joshua said to him, speak in the name of the Lord. And he says, it was me. I have this in my tent. <clears throat> it's buried there. And Joshua sent his men. They went and got it, brought it back. And he said that, okay, now we're going to have to deal with this issue. as what the Lord told me to. He took him and his family and the tribe and his donkeys and his animals. I mean, he took everything. He had his drawers and all, the tent and everything. Took it down in the valley, stoned them to death, and then buried them there. Church, I'm grateful for the grace of God today. That he does not stone us for our neglect and our disobedience. And that he does not destroy us the way that they had to hear in this story. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful today that God is merciful. Because listen, I, I am just as guilty today standing here before you as being neglectful to things that I know I'm supposed to do. We all are. But I believe the Lord is ready for us to stop just talking about what we should be doing and start doing what we're supposed to always have been doing. And then I believe he will position the church to see revival not just so that we can be infilled and, and full, but so that others can see signs and wonders and miracles and they can come to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we've got to get sin out of the camp, out of our lives, out of this situation. So I'm ready for a comeback. How about you, church? I'm ready for, I'm ready for God to come back, but I'm ready for the church to come back so that the people of, of the world can know who God is before he does. Chad, if you want to come. <clears throat> God wants to see souls saved today, church. There's only two types of people in the world, pastor. Those who are redeemed and those who are not yet redeemed. That's the only two types. Not Republican, not Democrat, not black, not white, not Hispanic, not Latino, not anything other than redeemed and not yet redeemed. And if we're in the house today and God has saved our souls and he's delivered us from the enemy's snare and he has given us a new life in him, then we are of the redeemed. And if there are those that are not yet redeemed, then we are to pray for those who are not yet redeemed. We are to reach out to those that are not yet saved. We are to love those that are not yet in the kingdom of God. We are to go after those that are not yet there quite ready. But God can start stirring in them. Why? because God never intended for us to be the saviors of the world he already did it when he died on the cross he yeah. did it for all of us in this world all he has intended for us to be are message carriers of the gospel of Jesus so that they might be able to hear the truth of the good news and if you can't say anything good any longer just talk about God and let the goodness of God roll off of your lips and let God's words settle in your spirit and I believe and without a shadow out of a doubt that God will rise up in us and God will rise up yet again in the church and we will have a comeback as the big church that the world has never seen. I know it seems grim right now, church. I know that we're seeming like we're being fighting against the battle and there's no hope and the rules and the laws and, and all the government and all the governances are changing against us. But let me remind you of one simple truth. God said to Joshua that wherever your foot may trod, I promise that I will give it to you. And I proclaim to you today, right here at the Forest Hill Church of God, that wherever you place your foot in faith and believe, God will give it to you once again. If you want to see a revival, then put your foot out in faith and know that God is going to bring it. If you want to see your sons and daughters who've walked away from their faith come back to a loving Savior named Jesus Christ, then take the step of faith that Jesus promises and get forward before.
before Him and let God have His way in your life. But in order for all of this to transpire, we have to deal with ourselves. Joshua had to get up out of his dust, put on some new clothes because he tore his old ones, and proclaim the good news of God. And after he dealt with the situation, this is what I love, church. Verse 1 of chapter 8. God says, now, the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid or dismayed. Now, we went from Joshua being the fame of the land to a but keeping him from being victorious to a now that's about to change the future forevermore. And I'm ready for the church to rise up to the now time that God has given us for such a time as this, for the Spirit of God to be poured out on all sons and all daughters and all people alike so that His kingdom can be seen and His kingdom can be praised and His kingdom of life can be transformed so that people's lives can be transformed. I'm ready for my now moment. I don't know about you. If, if you will, all over the house, stand with me this morning. I'm ready for my now moment. I hear that we have Sunday school at 10 15. It's 10 06, so I gave us some time. Y'all see that? I didn't go over. I gave us a little time because, in order for this to come, come to pass, I love you and I so am so glad to see you can pat me on the back and say good sermon or well done or woe is me but it's not about me or Mary or the kids today it's about Jesus if you're watching with us online it's about Jesus Christ and him crucified that's all that it matters today but in church for seal our heart is here with you we have never left you I want to see revival here just as much as if I was here and that could be everywhere God sends us to preach and travel but it starts right here so here's your moment church if you want to see revival if you need a miracle if you need healing if you need a touch from God I still believe in the altars I know we have COVID protocols let's be safe about it if you're unsure then make the altar where you are but if you are sure and you need God to touch you today then this altar is open for you you have time and if you run out of time Sunday school will still be there when you get done Amen, because this right now is your moment to be able to step into this now season that God has for you. So wherever you are in this place, yes. step out from where you are and step up here in this time of prayer. Kneel where you are, sit where you are, just spend some time and say, God, is there some things that I've been neglecting? Is there some things that I've been setting away from you? God, deal with my root issue. Don't let me just deal with the superficial stuff. Let me deal with that root challenge so that I can see it come back the now moment right now. Father God, all over this house, Lord, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice, God, that, Lord, you will touch them and empower them to feel your presence and your anointing in this place. Lord, if they're watching online, God, your spirit shed it and will to you can touch them right in the home, sitting on their recliner or their couch or driving down the road, God, right now in the name of Jesus, that their souls that need to know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you will touch them right now, heal them and deliver them and set them free. God, if there's anyone in this house that needs a touch from you, Lord, if they want you like never before.